great to be here. Um, of course, I'd like to take the song pledge. I think it's, uh, it's a great initiative, by the way. So here we are. So we're going to be old friends today, and nobody's going to get this talk because I'm going to introduce so long, even though my font is normally better known for shorts. So the stock we're going to talk about today is, uh, I think it's a fun stock. It's a uh, stock whose product most of the people in the room are probably very familiar with, uh, although probably not many are going to be users. <laughs> and it's Allergan. Allergan is a stock which is very well known because it's the producer of Botox. Well, that is our past campaigns, but it's irrelevant for tonight. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the number, Allergan is a market cap of $47 billion. It's a pharma company. It has two main divisions. Uh, one of them is the uh, traditional medical part. And the other part is cosmetics medical, which is mostly Botox, but they also have a bunch of other similar products. It sells about $16 billion and EBITDA of $7 billion. So um, the chart is really enticing. It's been losing about 60% in, in just a few years. Um, the trend seems to be negative. And just to give you a little bit of color on, on, on this company, it used to be called Actavis until recently. They redomiciled to Ireland for tax reasons. They did a smart move, maybe the only smart move that the management of this company did. They sold their generic division to Teva uh, right at the time where the generic business was starting to really get uh, problematic. And then foolishly went on an M&A spree, which, as you will see later, has not been very successful and has left the company with a lot of legacy problem and a lot of write-offs. The stock is very cheap, uh, pretty much according to any kind of metric we can think about. We'll see exactly why. But the main reason are, number one, is loss of exclusivity. So some of their drugs are losing patents. Number two, um, all of these write-offs, which are causing uh, people to lose confidence in the management. Number three, the, the flagship product, which you're all familiar with, Botox, um, is going to be facing a little bit of competitions in the years ahead. And finally, there are some active investors involved which have been stirring the water, so to speak. So this is a quick chart that shows you some of the main uh, products and where the growth or lack thereof is coming from. You see Botox there. You see Juvederm, which is kind of a complementary product to Botox. It's a dermal filler. And at the bottom, you see that detracting from growth are Restasis, which is one of the drugs that has recently lost patents, and some other drugs which are also uh, going loss of exclusivity soon. So that's the profits. You see negative profits. Last year, they lost over $7 billion. And I remind you, by the way, this is a long, it's not a short. Uh, <laughs> Um, and it's $14 billion of write-downs if you combine all of them. So not exactly a, a thriving business at first sight. If you look just a little deeper uh, underneath the surface, though, you see that the picture may look a little different. This is free cash flow. So you have a company that loses, uh, like a clockworks, $7 billion a year, but all of them is paper loss, as is write-down. The actual numbers are much better, and uh, it seems as though the company produces about $6 billion of free cash flow. That's, by the way, uh, leverage free cash flow. So um, you want to look a little bit underneath the service before you, you make a judgment. As I said, the stock is inexpensive. It doesn't matter what kind of metric you use. It's a 13% free cash flow yield, and eight times forward PE, and 10 times EV to EBITDA. EV to EBITDA is slightly more expensive just because they have a lot of that, but it's cheap. Same story if you compare it with the, with the major peers. It's usually among the cheapest pharma companies out there at the time where pharma is relatively cheap, historically speaking. Same story with the PE. So what's going on? What's all this uncertainty? Why are people scared of the, of the stock where they're selling it? And you'll see that some of these concerns are legitimate, but overall, we believe that the discount is, is excessive and improving the situation shouldn't be too hard. So number one, I mentioned it before briefly, if fear for for Botox because of this new competition that's coming online. Number two, uh, people start to get concerned about the management that has been buy buying like enormous amounts of, of new drugs and new companies uh, with failing results. Loss of exclusivity, 
And finally, there is a bit of a high leverage. Okay, cash flows are very steady, but still it's 3.2 uh, times that to EBITDA ratio, so a lot of leverage. Now, the idea is, I think in any kind of successful investing, to always look underneath the surface and, and trying to either corroborate or deny the market thesis based on digging a little deeper. And I think I, I learned that mostly through my short selling activity, which uh, is mostly based on investigations. Now, in the long, sometimes it's less important, but still you will find that in any stock there is almost always one or two critical issues that the market is cared about or doesn't understand. And very often, you're not going to manage to find the answers in the company filings or in sell side research, but if you dig a little deeper, if you go and talk to the people, if you go down and get your hands dirty in the field, sometimes you get some interesting insights. So this is what I'm going to try to share with you today. So problem number one, loss of exclusivity. Company has $16 billion of sales and combined 1.2, 1.3 billion of, of drugs which are going off patent soon. Uh, that's only 9%. And uh, it's going to be more than compensated by the growth in the uh, core portfolio. So the company is going to grow approximately at the same rate in the next two years of its drug going off, uh, off patent. So it's not going to have a, uh, not going to be a dent in the, in the earning power. Write-offs, poor management, we saw them before. Uh, it's definitely a big issue. There have been some spectacular failures of some drugs that they bought, for example, Rapastinel. Um, which recently failed in the, in the phase three and costed a lot of billions of dollars. No new champions, not a lot of creativity in the, in the M&A pipeline, in my opinion, which has been heavily underperforming. Not much to say about that, except maybe that uh, management has to go. And probably what is the main concern right now is Botox. We believe Botox is a great franchise. You see, it's growing very fast. It's an underpenetrated market. Only about 9% of potential users are actually using it, even, even less if you look internationally. It's growing at a CAGR of 9% per year. It has a strong demographic tailwind because people tend to use Botox as they, as they age and people are, are not getting any younger on average. It has very high margins. And uh, what I like about it the most is that this company trades like a, like a pharma stock, but at the end of the day, at least the Botox part is much more similar to a consumer product. There is no regulatory risk, almost. Um, and there is no problem about payments or Medicare or insurance because Botox is paid cash. So it's much more similar to a consumer luxury product than, than to your sim typical prescription drug. That is Botox market share. About 10 years after the coming online of existing competition, they're still 70% 70, 70 dominant, even though their existing competition is equivalent products which uh, sell at a discount. So they have a very strong, very entrenched position right now. The problem is the new competition that's coming online. If somebody has been reading the, on the Wall Street Journal, there have been a, a couple of nasty uh, articles about this, saying that the uh, other guys should start to worry because of these uh, competitors coming in. One of them is a product called Juvo. Juvo is an analog to Botox. They're, the clinical studies show that they're pretty much equivalent, so it's no more, no less effective. It's uh, produced by this company called Evolus, which is a small biotech, capitalizes less than uh, half a billion dollars. It's marketed very aggressively right now. It's not, it's not sold yet, or it's in the process of just starting to be sold right now. And the game that they're playing is they're not really giving any discount at retail level, but they're basically going to dermatologists and giving them at the doctor level a 15 to 25% discount in order to entice them to, uh, to start using the product. The other competing product, which is carrying everybody that looks at the stock, is this Daxi, um, produced by another biotech company called Revens. Now, Revens, uh, this product will be approved in 2020, so it's not available yet. And the distinguishing feature is that it's being marketed as being longer lasting than Botox. If anybody has ever had a Botox injection, um, you will know that in about three months, you've got to go back to the doctor and get another one, because the effect fades. And um, if it's Daxi, apparently it lasts a couple of extra months. Now, we look into this and we spoke to a few dermatologists about it. It seems as though, it's not 100% certain, but it seems as though the longer lasting is just a result of higher dosage. So the molecule is very similar. And to our understanding, Allergan is working right now on a longer lasting, higher dosage um, version of Botox. So it, it probably should not impact too much. These are the clinical studies that confirm what I just said. 
So, because this is the central issue, I think it's important to make more, uh, both a bull and a bear case. The bull case is probably verges on brand strengths, and Botox is one of those products that kind of defines the category, um, kind of like Kleenex, you know, you, you want a Kleenex, basically the brand names the kind of product. It's the same uh, issue with Botox. There is some degree of customer lock-in, which mostly stem from the fact that the, uh, the end user feels comfortable with one brand, and number two, that the doctor needs training in order to understand how to inject uh, these botulinum toxins into a patient, and therefore they're going to be probably switching uh, not very enthusiastically because they need to get retraining. There are some synergies in having a portfolio of cosmetic products like uh, Allergan has, because they, basically, they become a one-stop shop for a dermatologist to get all or their cosmetics, whereas the existing uh, competition only sell a single version, and for example, uh, Xeomain or Diasport. Uh, competition has been going on for Botox for the last 10 years, and the existing competitors are very well capitalized, especially Xeomain, which is another analog, analog of Botox. It's actually owned by Nestle. Nestle is the uh, Swiss food company. And it's also sold uh, often together with its own dermal filler, which is called Restyline, which is also a very strong brand name and, and very well-known product. And still, Xiaomi didn't manage to get more than 9% market rate in 10 years. The bear case is a bit more pessimistic. So we spoke to a lot of dermatologists. Some of them told us, hey, um, if the financial sense is strong enough, we will probably switch or we will start offering these competing products as well. Uh, the product choice is usually taken by a doctor. So the way it works is the patient goes to the doctor typically, asks for Botox, and then the doctor would inject whatever is most feasible for, for him or her. If that is the issue, then if they are incentivized, incentivized enough, they will probably start offering competitors. And finally, there is the issue of effectiveness. Uh, if new products are indeed more effective or, or safer than Botox, then Botox may lose a little market share. Bottom line is, Botox, although most people are familiar with the cosmetics only, it's mostly a medical product. And it kind of cures all sorts of diseases, like for example, uh, bladder problems or migraines or many others. So there are a lot of indications. And actually, most of the revenue that Allergan makes from Botox belong to the medical uh, part, not to the, uh, not to the cosmetic. So the cosmetic is about 10% of the revenue of the company. So our understanding is, even if there is a little bit of a loss of market share, which will probably be uh, a few percentage points, it's barely going to be noticed in the, uh, in the overall sales of the company. And finally, it's a growing market. It grows at uh, you know, high double digits, uh, high single digits CAGR. Therefore, we understand that uh, even if they were to lose some market share or some competitors should come in, they would probably um, be absorbed by the new growth rather than taking um, necessarily sales from, from Allergan. So it's a simple company. It's a simple case of a very undervalued situation. And I think there are many ways to win. The easiest way to win, which we definitely prefer, is if there is some sort of a management shakeout. We're firm believers in capitalism, we're firm believer in meritocracy, and we believe that in general, if there are failings, then management has to go, and it, this has been pretty clear now. If not necessarily the executives, at least the business development team or whoever was responsible for the failing M&A should probably go, and we think that will be very promptly remunerated by the market with an, uh, with an expanding uh, multiple. But let's say that the management is very well entrenched, as it seemed to be. I think there is a case to, to make that even if nothing is done, the company stands still, and all they do is use that copious amount of uh, free cash flow to deleverage and make buybacks, you'll find yourself in two, three years with a completely with a debt-free company, um, increasing earning per share with a core portfolio that grows at high single digits. And uh, which, and this brings us to the next point, will be either a very attractive uh, buy target for one of the larger competitor, um, or a company that could be split, for example, into division, splitting the medical from the cosmetics. Or another catalyst could be simply that the, the Botox fears, which seem to be the main reason for the undervaluation, will prove unfounded. So the moment that people understand that uh, the product gets sold and new competition gets absorbed by the market without any, any fanfare, then we understand that multiple will expand. 
There are right now two notable investors. One of them is a very aggressive active investor, is David Tepper from Appalooza. The other one is a, one of the most celebrated value investors in the world, is Seth Glarmer from Baupost. So both of them have uh, large positions in the company. David Tepper in particular has been very vocal against management and has been trying to attack them left and right and get them to, uh, to either step down or separate the CEO from the chairman role. Uh, so far, it has been unsuccessful, but we like investors such as this one to be in place just because it's less likely that uh, management will now do something silly like another acquisition. We joined our call, as I said earlier, we believe management has to go. Uh, at least part of it, the people that were responsible for those uh, reckless m and Another mistake they did is uh, buy back at the wrong timing. So they've been doing a lot of, uh, of buybacks, but if you see the bulk of that buyback occurred in 2016. 2016, the company was trading close to all-time high. Uh, and the pace of the buyback has actually slowed down recently, even though the price of the company is much lower. So we understand that some of that buyback has been destroying value rather than creating it. Uh, we started the compensation of the management. On management, we think it's, uh, it's, at best, it's unclear. At worst, it's definitely not aligned with shareholder value. We've been checking out very, very frequently the communication the management has been having in the last few years, and I think it's been at best characterized by lack of transparency and candor. And we basically think that management in place is the main reason why the stock is undervalued. So we think they have to go. To conclude, it's a company that's trading at a single digit P in a very fast growing uh, market. We believe that the Botox fears are completely overblown company keeps generating strong free cash flow, is deleveraging and buying back stocks. Uh, the multiples is incredibly depressed. And um, worst case scenario, there is a couple of very strong active investors we should preserve. At the very least, keep the, the management from doing uh, something foolish. So given the fact that the market is, despite the, uh, the latest volatility, is still quite expensive, um, this is a good idea to maybe build a position in something that's relatively safe and very, very cheap. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. Thank you.